Madam Chair, we're now live. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, November 23rd uh, meeting of the Special General Government Committee. I will be your chair this morning. Due to the COVID-19 emergency declaration, this meeting of the General Government Committee is being held electronically and live streamed on the town's website. All members of council in attendance are participating by audio and video teleconference and town staff are available throughout the meeting if council members have any questions on the agenda. For members of the public watching from home, please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties throughout the meeting. I'll now call this meeting to order. Are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, we'll move uh, adoption of minutes. There are no minutes, so let's move right to section four presentations. We have two this morning. 4.1 Corporate Asset Management Plan, Core Assets, presented by uh, Director of Operations, Dave Meredith. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair and, and members of Council. Um, I just wanted to provide a, a brief overview or general introduction before I turn it over to the, to the two presenters. Um, as Council is aware, um, in 2017, the province of Ontario identified the requirement for municipalities to complete asset management plans. Um, the town is currently legislated, like all other municipalities, to have their asset management plan for all assets approved by Council by July 1st of 2025. Um, the asset management plan that's before you today that, that Rick Chalmers will be presenting is focused on the core assets. Um, the core assets relates to roads, bridges, culverts, as well as the stormwater management network. Uh, during the next term of council, um, we'll be dealing with the balance of the municipal assets, as well as a financial strategy to support the levels of service that council eventually approves. Um, and as you've heard our director of finance comment many times, the asset management plan will be a guiding document that will allocate the appropriate money to the appropriate reserves to maintain our assets long term um, at a council approved level of service, which again will happen sort of between 2023 2024 timeframe. Um, so that's really where we're at from a from a town perspective in terms of sort of the rollout and implementation of the asset management plan. It's something that's that's not going to go away. It, it is something that will be part of our sort of community fabric and, and will be something that we need to look at um, basically, basically forever to ensure that the assets that we currently do own are at the appropriate condition and that they're replaced at the appropriate time. So, so having said that, I will turn it over to Rick Chalmers who will guide us through the asset management plan prior to turning it over to our our consultant who will lead you through a workshop. So Rick, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we have a lot of information to get through this morning, so we'll get started. Um, the first presentation has been pre-recorded, so if you could please hold your questions to the end, and we'll be happy to pull up any slides that you'd like to discuss. Um, so you can go ahead and start the presentation. I'm Rick Chalmers, the Supervisor of Infrastructure and Asset Management, and with me today is Michael Chi, one of the town's senior financial analysts. We will be presenting the findings of the 2021 Asset Management Plan for Core Assets. This Asset Management Plan is the conclusion of two years of extensive data gathering, detailed analysis, and staff workshops. Let's begin with a few highlights. The majority of core transportation and stormwater assets are in fair or better condition. This is in one part due to the age of these assets, and secondly, that these assets typically have long service lives. Asset life cycle activities are vital to ensure that assets achieve their full service life and provide the intended value to customers. Without these maintenance and rehabilitation activities at recommended intervals, asset conditions will deteriorate at an accelerated rate. There is currently a $15.3 million annual funding gap to meet the current capital and operating needs of core assets. Very quickly, a bit of background. The first asset management plan was brought to council in February of 2017. At that time, the province was working on an asset management regulation, 
which would provide direction to municipalities in the rollout of future plans. The regulation requires municipalities to have an asset management policy, which was done in March of 2019. As part of the regulation, the town is required to document the current levels of service, develop proposed levels of service, and develop a financial strategy to fund these levels of service. To date, the town has documented the current level of service and are in the process of developing the proposed levels of service. The province has recently amended the asset management regulation deadlines for the rollout of each phase of the asset management plan. We have and will continue to meet all of the deadlines for plan approvals. The first legislated date for the endorsement of the Corporate Asset Management Plan for core assets is July 1, 2022. Under the regulation, the Asset Management Plan must include our current core assets consisting of roads, bridges, and stormwater management, the current level of service with prescribed qualitative descriptions along with technical performance metrics. The current performance and asset condition is to be compared against these metrics. The life cycle activities that will be taking place for each of the next 10 years and show the cost of these activities, and the estimated capital and significant operating costs for life cycle activities as a result of increased demand from growth and development. The core asset hierarchy in this asset management plan is as shown here. There are additional subclasses as necessary to get to a more granular level of detail and allow for targeted reporting to the federal and provincial governments. One of the assets with the largest valuation is often the road network. In this plan, we have included our gravel roads in the inventory, which is now a requirement of the regulation. The total replacement value for road assets is $588 million. The culvert inventory shown on this slide includes mostly the large span structural concrete and steel culverts. The bridge inventory includes typical roadway bridges. The bridge and culvert inventory is based on the 2019 municipal bridge inventory and inspection. The replacement values have been brought forward to $2020 and the 2021 bridge inspection was completed this year and will inform the next asset management plan. One of the most ignored asset categories is stormwater management. These assets are mainly unseen and most are buried out of sight. They are, however, some of our most critical infrastructure and for this reason, the province has deemed them to be a core asset. At a $249 million replacement value, their replacement cost is five times more than bridges and culverts. Core transportation assets are based on visual observations by both staff and consultants. Pavement conditions are evaluated by engineers using both dashboard observations and road scanning technology. Bridges and culverts are evaluated through field observations by structural engineers. The majority of the stormwater management assets are based on the age of the asset. However, stormwater ponds are split between age-based and condition-based ratings. In the past, there have been a limited number of pond assessments done, however many of the oldest ponds have still not been assessed. The new storm sewer inspection program will provide accurate conditions of our 371 kilometers of pipes over the next six years. Overall majority, or 92.4% of our core infrastructure is in fair or better condition. The town is still young, so this is expected. However, the condition is on the decline. The values shown on this slide represent the replacement value distribution. While we are doing very well with the majority of these assets, we should not lose sight of the fact that 7.6% are in poor or very poor condition, equaling $68.3 million. The majority, or 95%, of our core transportation infrastructure is in fair or better condition. The addition of new roads is helping to maintain the high percentage of core transportation assets in this condition. For roads, the average pavement quality index in 2020 was 69. In the previous plan, the PQI was 73 based on the 2016 pavement data. The majority, or 85.7% of stormwater management infrastructure, is in fair or better condition. The condition of the majority of the stormwater management assets is based on the age of the asset. The new sewer inspection program 
will gradually provide assessment-based condition ratings, but until the entire storm sewer system has been evaluated at least once, we will be basing conditions on a hybrid of age and assessments. The accuracy of stormwater pond conditions is only as good as the latest information that we have. In many cases, there is no condition data for older ponds. Historically, ponds were not dredged by developers prior to assumption by the town, and not all of those that were are known to staff. Accelerated condition assessments of all stormwater pond assets is recommended in order to provide accurate condition information and inform future capital needs. Phase 1 of the Level of Service Strategic Plan was recently completed where the current asset levels of service were compiled to form a baseline for the development of the proposed levels of service. The next couple of slides are the Level of Service Framework and the results of the Core Asset Current Level of Service Study. We have now started working with staff on the development of the proposed levels of service. Workshops have been held with staff in all asset areas and will continue with follow-up sessions as we work with the information received from each group. Work on the proposed levels of service will continue into the new year. The town has developed a level of service framework relevant to the town's assets. A level of service framework supports leading practices in asset management and it enables transparent trade-off of level of service, risk, and cost of service beginning with corporate levels of service, typically found outlined in the strategic plan. Next, we have legislated levels of service governed through regulations such as OREG 588.17. There are many other regulations that also govern the levels of service, which are specific to individual asset types. We then move into customer and technical levels of service. Customer levels of service measures how the community receives the service and whether the organization is providing community value. Technical level of service relates to the activities that the organization undertakes to best achieve the desired outcomes and demonstrate effective performance. Customer level of service are typically grouped into four service attribute categories which have corresponding technical levels of service. Capacity and use directly relates to growth. Function relates to upgrade needs. Quality relates to renewal operations and maintenance activities. And affordability relates to financial sustainability. This is what makes up the framework. Using the information that we have gained through this framework, we now need to look at what activities we need to do to our assets in order to achieve the levels of service. The activities are broken down into five categories. Expansion or new assets, upgrade, renewal, maintenance, operations, and finally, these all have costs. The first three types of activities are typically funded through the capital budget. While maintenance and operations are typically funded through the operating budget, the workshop that is following this presentation will provide an example of how this framework is used. Customer level of service performance is graded on a scale from very poor to very good for each of the three customer level of service categories in this framework. Let's look at capacity and use. This is where we want to know if services have enough capacity and are accessible to everybody. Staff rated stormwater management performance is fair. This will require some investment to increase this level of service. For transportation, staff rated this as good. For the function category, defined as services meet customer needs while limiting health, safety, security, natural, and heritage impacts. Staff rated the stormwater management performance as very poor, which is reasonable since there isn't a budget for upgrades. For transportation, staff rated this as very good. For the quality category, defined as services are reliable and responsive to customers. Staff rated the stormwater management performance as very good. In this case, there was a small renewal budget, but we'll come back to this in a later, later slide. For transportation, staff rated this as good. Our infrastructure is still young, so the quality of our transportation assets is still good as shown on a previous slide. In asset management, risk is the effect of uncertainty on an organization's ability to meet its objectives. Risk sources are found in both the internal and external environment. Examples of these 
are internally through limited budgets or insufficient staff resources, and externally through road closures or overflowing ponds. We've all seen this expression before. Risk equals the probability of asset failure multiplied by the consequence of asset failure. The expression evaluates the possible loss by considering both the probability that an event will occur and the consequence of that event occurring. The resulting factor is where the current risk falls on the color-coded criticality scale. To identify and mitigate risk, we conduct road, bridge, and culvert state of good repair inspections in accordance with the minimum maintenance standards to identify defects and take corrective actions. We conduct pavement condition evaluations on every roadway on a three-year rotation to forecast the deterioration of roads, conduct preventative maintenance activities, and budget for rehabilitations and major reconstructions. Through requirements under the Highway Traffic Act, the Bridge Act, and the Public Transportation and Highway Improvement Act, we conduct inspections on bridge and culvert structures under the direction of a professional engineer at the prescribed maximum two-year intervals. Not every roadway, bridge, or culvert is of equal importance or presents the same failure risk to the town. Understanding which are critical and how they might fail helps focus life cycle management strategies on what is most important. A risk analysis was conducted for bridges and culverts to determine the level of risk that each structure poses. The resulting risk levels are used to prioritize rehabilitation projects. These charts show the estimated rehabilitation costs for each level of risk for bridges and culverts. For bridges, the town is mitigating $0.35 million of extreme risk through the 2021 to 2025 long range capital forecast. The design for the rehabilitation of the Church Street Bridge over Duffins Creek, just south of Mill Street, is taking place in 2021 and the rehabilitation work is scheduled for 2023. Both bridge and culvert significant risks continue to be in the low probability range and will be updated through the 2021 bridge and culvert inspections. At this time, risk evaluations for roadways has not been conducted but are part of future improvements in asset management. These charts show the level of risk exposure that we currently have for stormwater management assets. The $1.74 million of extreme risk in ponds is made up of three ponds nearing 20 years old and one pond that's 22 years old, none of which have been dredged to our knowledge and all have significant properties or infrastructure downstream. The 2021 to 2025 long range capital forecast is not mitigating the risk that these ponds pose. The risk model was not available when developing the 2021 capital program. Pond conditions and risks can really only be determined through condition assessments. The next pond condition assessments are in 2025 according to the long range capital forecast. In the storm sewer chart, there is $5.4 million categorized as extreme risk. The age of the storm sewer pipes categorized as extreme risk averaged 61 years old. The average diameter is greater than one meter and most are under collector or higher classes of roads or within town properties. The probability of risk starts with the condition of pipes, which is still being calculated by the age of the pipe. Through the sewer inspection program that begins this year, the true conditions and needs will be known after the full cycle of inspections. On the consequence side, the diameter and location factors are known for the most part. The diameters of some pipes is unknown and has been assumed. The sewer inspections will provide more accurate diameter information. I will now pass it over to Michael to walk you through the financial impacts. Thank you, Rick. Here's the chart of annual funding gap. The capital funding gap for roads and sewers is $13.87 million per year based on the needs of $27.5 million on average. Operating funding gap is $1.46 million per year. Here's a table showing where the capital and operating needs compared to the funding. The majority of the annual funding gap is the existing road and stormwater capital needs of $19.2 million and $6.3 million respectively. New construction of $8 million is funded mostly by the development charges while assumed assets of $10.7 million in the acquisition column 
were initially built by the developers. However, we have not directly addressed the future capital operating needs. This is starting to be shown in the assumption reports. Here is the long-term outlook of the existing capital needs. As you can see, there are spikes in some years where many of the core assets will be due for major reconstruction. If we draw the line of the average need of 19.25 million, this will show that in some years we are saving for the future spikes of the large reconstruction needs over time, like the stormwater replacements and road reconstruction. With the existing average funding of 5.61 million from the road maintenance, federal gas tax, and stormwater management fund, we are not saving for the current and future needs of the road and stormwater assets. In this chart is a breakdown of the long-term outlook of the capital road needs. I will show how each renewal interval adds up to the total road needs. With the crack seal every five years, it looks like this. For mill and overlay, it shows longer cycles. Then with resurfacing in year 45 for every road. And the largest cost of the reconstruction happens every 90 years. This cycle would be possible if we do every item in the life cycle activity on time. If we miss a mill overlay, we shorten the life of the road, so resurfacing and reconstruction happen sooner. With all the interventions, we will need 15.07 million per year. There will be some years where we would have to spend more than what we collected in road resurfacing, and other years where we are saving more. So using the 2017 data into the same model, we get a graph like this. As you can see, the reconstruction cost of the road was started around 2091, with cyclical events happening over the life cycle of the roads. In comparison to 2021, where the reconstruction is starting earlier, this is due to life cycle activities that are not completed on time, as represented by the initial spike at the start of the graph. Here is the backlog of the road from payer management system over the next 10 years. When we add the road reserve balance, we get this. Then adding the road maintenance contributions, and FGT contributions, we will still be underfunded as represented by growing backlog. This is taking into account that most of the roads are in new condition. As stated before, when we miss key renewal intervals, the lifespan of the road decreases while the cost to rehabilitate increases dramatically. For stormwater needs, it's relatively straightforward in terms of the life cycle intervals, inspections, cleaning, and replacement. Here is the renewal needs for the stormwater management ponds. Then we have manholes and catch basins, outfalls, oil grit separators, and concrete and PVC pipes. Over the long term, the major reconstruction is in 2089 and 2105. The average need will be 3.33 million. As Rick has mentioned, the data is age based. As we get condition based data, we can update the model to better reflect the renewal needs. The majority of the initial needs highlighted in red are with the stormwater ponds that need dredging in the short term. To address the funding gap, we will need to look at several strategies. We do acknowledge that until we have all assets conditionally assessed and level service set, we will not be able to do all the options at this moment. One option would be to rebalance the reserves and have the spending caps removed. There will be some years where we will be spending more than what we collected for major reconstruction as shown in the previous graphs. Another option is to dedicate capital levy. A 1% capital levy represents 759000 of revenue per year. This will help offset the casino Ajax revenues as being lost. The next option is to have a dedicated stormwater category in development funding. Currently, stormwater costs is included in the road development charges. We also have the option of debt financing some of the larger reconstruction projects. Recently, we changed the debt management policy to include other assets. It may be more beneficial to borrow at a lower interest rate environment and reconstruct sooner as construction inflation has gone up faster. We are also pursuing grant funding opportunities when available. If we have healthy reserve balance, we will be more readily available to take advantage of these grants. In the future, we will be standardizing the capital planning process with a focus on risk. Currently, we are formally applying risk to capital management process. So there's still a lot more to do going forward. Asset management is all about continuous improvement. As you get better data, we'll be able to provide more in-depth analysis and models to make decisions. Currently, we're working towards conditional assessments for all assets. This is expected to be completed for most assets by next asset management update. The consultants are also working on public surveys and proposed level surveys. Another big factor is how climate change affects the future needs. As we find analysis, we will start incorporating climate change as part of the risk management. 
conclusion, 92.4% of the core transportation and stormwater assets contained in the asset management plan are in fair or better condition. This is expected for relatively young to the Ajax, although since 2017, this has decreased by 2.6% and is expected to accelerate at the current funding level. The addition of new roads is helping to maintain a higher percentage of core transportation assets in fair or better condition. Average annual funding gap of $15.3 million over the next 10 years is currently unfunded. The funding gap has increased over the 2017 asset management plan due to prolonged underfunding and inclusion of more advanced life cycle management calculations due to maturity of the asset management practices. Overall, we're in a good position to change. We have time to make long-term decisions that will address the large reconstruction costs that will eventually come. However, the continued integration of core transportation and stormwater assets will reduce the level of service and increase the unmitigated risk exposure. The town is on track to meet all legislative deadlines under OVRAG 58017. That's the end of the presentation. We thank you for your time and we'll take any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, before I open it up to questions, I'd like to call on CAO Baker, um, who has some comments to make. Go ahead, please. Good morning, uh, members of council. Uh, I just wanted to make uh, a comment that um, I know that, you know, over the over this term of council, especially at the very beginning when I met with you and presented my 100 day assessment that I presented that there were a number of um, local municipal mandated plans or, or issues that needed to be addressed, like the IT strategy, the fire master plan, parks and rec plan, so on and so on. Um, as you have just seen this presentation, you can see that there's a huge funding gap and, and I'm sure that, you know, it's it's coming as a, as a shock to you. Um, but I can, I, I think it's important for me to note at this time, and, and Dave Meredith can speak to this a little bit afterwards, um, that this legislation is handcuffing all municipalities. I don't know of, of any municipalities that are actually in a financial position to be able to deal with the requirements of their asset management plan. And frankly, um, you know, that's why the province uh, brought forward this legislation because municipalities weren't dealing with this issue. They were just, they were just letting, you know, putting their infrastructure in the ground and then, you know, expecting it to be dealt with uh, later on and they'd have the money to do so. But as municipalities grew and infrastructure, infrastructure ages, it's almost impossible to be able to manage it that way because the cost is so high. Um, so the key here from uh, you know the CAO's position uh, across the across the province is that we need to be lobbying other levels of government. It's my understanding that Ontario big city mayors is already doing so. Um, Ajax, as you did here, is in a better position than most re uh, related to their infrastructure. Um, cities like Osh, older cities like Oshawa, the city of Toronto, et cetera, are, have a huge, a huge, massive gapping hole that they need to fill um, based on this legislation and the timelines required in this legislation. In the report, it does note that you know we'll be reporting back with the financial um, uh, plan by I believe it's 2025, Dave. Correct. So that's the requirement in the legislation. But I just wanted to make council aware that. Uh, this is, not an, this is not just an Ajax problem. This is a provincial problem for all municipalities having to deal with this. And, and the younger the municipality is, the better position they're in, the older they are, the worse they're in. Uh, Dave, did you have any comments regarding the, the funding gap and the legislation? No, I think you, you've captured it quite well. I just wanted to sort of reiterate your comments, Shane, about the fact that you know, Ajax is relatively well positioned compared to other municipalities across the province in terms of the funding gap. So um, that is that is factual. Um, what I want to say is, you know, we're not looking for immediate resolution to the funding gaps that currently exist. We think in, in discussions with with finance, we need to have or council needs to have a complete picture of all of the assets, right? So right now, this is just focused on the core assets being roads and the storm sewer network. But in order to develop a, um, a financial um, strategy, council needs a complete picture of all municipal assets. So that's your fire assets, your recreational assets, your facilities, your um, outdoor recreation amenities, everything gets captured through this plan. And then council will ultimately have a complete picture 
of all municipal assets, their conditions. And then when we develop a funding strategy or model, it's more comprehensive in terms of how we allocate funds um, sort of um, on a go forward basis. So that's really, and that's really not gonna come together until the end of the next term of council, right? So we've got a municipal election coming up next year and then we're probably the end of 2024 before we're in a position to present that complete funding strategy or funding model along with the condition of all municipal assets. So there's a lot of work over the next two to three years that need to take place. And this is sort of a, a precursor to what council is going to be seeing over that period of time. And as different classes of assets are prepared, those presentations will be made to council. So there's, we're not gonna have like a two or three year gap and you're not gonna hear from us again until we've done the other assets. As asset classes are, are looked at and as we have those conditions, we will be bringing those reports at regular intervals to council over the next three years. So just be, just before we move off, I, I you know further to Dave's comments, uh, you will recall that you know we've already presented to you the the uh, state of our stormwater ponds and the requirement to start financing or or putting money away to be dealing with those because frankly right now those are an immediate uh, issue that we need to deal with. So. As, as Dave said, uh, the, the other infrastructure is in relatively good shape and can wait in, in, until 2024 for us to bring back financial uh, sustainability plan. Uh, however, if there are issues like stormwater that seem to arise between now and then, then we'll bring it forward to you. But, but I'm sure you're all, I'm sure you were all thinking as you're watching the numbers and the, the bad news on the stormwater ponds, wait a minute, we already talked about this and we, we did a good thing by agreeing to address it, and yes, you did, um, and uh, and council should be applauded for that. So um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to make those comments before we move forward. I didn't uh, I, I didn't want you to think that you know Ajax was sitting out and uh, had these issues to deal with. You're 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 one of many many municipalities that have uh, the same issue that they have to deal with. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sierra Baker. Thank you, Director Meredith. So we'll open it up to questions now. Uh, the first person that I saw was Regional Councillor Crawford, followed by Regional Councillor Lee. Go ahead, Marilyn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for this report. I'm very happy that we're not in as bad a shape as other municipalities. However, this is probably one of the most re depressing reports I've ever heard <laughs> in maybe 12 years. <laughs> Uh, we already knew our stormwater management um, ponds were going to be a problem. We've been talking about this, I think, probably the whole time I've been on council. This has been one of those topics. Um, Dave, can you refresh me on how many stormwater ponds we have? Oh, um, My recollection, I might be outdated a little bit. I know I was in the 60 range, but we may have assumed more than that over um, over recent time. Rick, do you have a, a specific number offhand? Offhand, no, I don't have a specific number. You're, you're in the range, but around 60. Okay, because that's, that's, I guess, kind of important when we're look, talking about assets. And the other thing is, so the the three you mentioned, um, one is 23 years old and the other two are 20. Would they be the oldest that we have or just the most need right now? Those would be the oldest that we don't have information on whether they've ever been dredged or not. Okay. Um, yeah, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just to say, um, Regional Councillor Crawford, there are older ponds that have been dredged and, and maintained. I think ponds started to be constructed sort of in the mid to late 80s, right? So some of them are the original ones, maybe 30 years old, but they have, um, through previous budgets, been been dredged okay. at least once. Okay. And how and do you know how often you would need to dredge a pond like that? Like how long? Like is it once? in its existence is it or does it is it really dependent on the area generally it's in that 10 to 15 year time frame it can be extended a bit longer um, but that's part of an ongoing and active inspection program right so that's part of what was referenced in this document if you have an active program where your ponds are 
being assessed from a condition perspective on a regular basis. You're always going to have most the most current information to make the best decisions and the timing to make those investments. So we are somewhat limited in terms of the technical information that we have available to, to make some of those decisions. And that's part of, I guess, the funding gap that we've talked about in terms of allocating funding to ensure that we've got those ongoing inspections. Um, Rick, do you have anything to add? I guess, I guess the only thing I would add is that um, once the development is complete and they have been, been dredged out and we take um, um, ownership of those ponds, um, the sediment shouldn't build up as fast as long as we keep up with the street sweeping um, and there's no further development in that area draining to it, then then we we will um, probably exceed the 10 years and, and with the pond condition assessments, um, we'll start to know how, how far we can go. Okay, um, and one other question, if you don't mind, Madam Chair, is uh, I think we talked about a levy uh, on stormwater management, but it wasn't quite as simple as we anticipated. Is that correct? Maybe this is more for the director of finance. Go ahead, please, Director Valentin. Thank you, and through the chair to uh, Regional Councillor Crawford. Um, we are still investigating how we can uh, bring forward that levy. Um, we have reached out to the region, we've re reached out to Lexicon. So there is a project coming forward in 2022 to help us try and identify how we're going to um, initiate that user fee. Okay, all right, thank you. I may have more questions, but that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Regional Councillor Lee, followed by Mayor Collier. Go ahead, please, Sterling. What happens to us as a municipality if we don't uh, follow the municipal guideline of having a corporate asset management plan? Like, what if we don't upkeep our assets? Like, you know, in a sense, we didn't really have a, a framework of keeping track of the value of everything. What if, what if we didn't follow this? What, what, would, the, what would the penalty be? I can answer Director that. Yeah, <laughs> Thank go you ahead. through the chair to Regional Councillor Lee. Um, first and foremost, we would lose our um, grant funding. So this is one of the requirements under federal gas tax that we have an asset management plan in place. So um, any other levels of uh, grants and things that are proposed, that's basically one of the questions that they ask. Do you have an up-to-date asset management plan in place? Fair enough. Can't get away with that way then. So I guess my next question is, um, do we, and I think Councillor Dyes has mentioned this numerous times, is there a mechanism to keep track of our natural assets? And is there any way to like, because uh, I notice these are all our, you know, tangible assets, but what about like our, you know, our lakefront, our conservation areas, anything like that? Do we ever, is there a mechanism to keep track of the value of those and the upkeep of those? So we do, we do have, evaluation and I will use our, our trees as an example. So we do have a complete asset of all our tr street trees and park trees and we have an associated value associated with those. So just like our um, you know our park space as well and the amenities within our park space, they will or they're in the process of being captured as assets. So whether it's a, a playground, a park bench, um, a splash pad, all those components will be captured as assets through the asset management plan. And we'll be able to quantify the value and the replacement costs associated with each of those sort of over the next couple of years as the, as the plan unfolds. Okay, that helps. Um, those are all my questions. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Next, we have Mayor Collier followed by Regional Councillor Dyes. Go ahead, Sean. Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you for the presentation. I, I didn't find this depressing. I, I pretty much expected uh, this is where we're going. Problem is, we've we've had a few hits this term, being the you know the fire master plan as well as a couple other uh, big things that we're having to deal with all at once, which makes it more difficult. Just going forward, when when we have to set a level of service. Are we going to be provided with data like if we have a 13 million dollar short fund in um, revenue now to do a hundred percent are we going to be presented with well you know with with 
$6 million, we can maintain 80% or something like that to give us a better idea of the level of service that we need to, I mean, we've talked about level of service, whether it comes to parking, litter cleanup, grass cutting, all these other things. Um, will we be given those options? I think what, what will happen as an example, and Rick, you can maybe identify the timing, but as the level of service document sort of reaches um, and goes through the process, there will be options that will be available to council. And I can use, roads is always the best example. Like ultimately council can adopt sort of a targeted pavement quality index that they wish to achieve. So if we, if, if council says that, and you'd obviously need all of the information, I'm just using the, the numbers right now, but if you're saying that you wanted to maintain a pavement quality index or PQI of 70, what's the cost to maintain that? If it was 65, what is the cost to maintain that? So there would be options available to council that you will be then asked to adopt in terms of what is the target that we're trying to achieve and each has a different a different level of cost. So, so we will present those options. Um, I used roads as an example, Rick. Um, I assume that um, that information is accurate that, and if there's anything you wanted to add, yeah, that's that's the purpose of the level of service strategic plan. Is that it ultimately comes out with a um, proposed level of service that is um, funded, so so it's it's affordable to the uh, to the town, and um, currently or right now, communications is working on a um, public survey that will be going out um, to the public to to hear their desires on where our levels of service should be. Okay. Yeah, it's, this is a tough one because, you know, adding on a, a couple of percent tax increase, if residents can see it, that's one thing. Like we've built a new community center, we've done this. But when you're talking about pipes in the ground and stormwater, and they, they can't appreciate where the money's going, it makes it more difficult. But I guess that's why we're here to make the, the tough choices. So um, I look forward to seeing that. Uh, did you say the this is the core services or the core assets? Is it in the in June, Dave? You said that the next version is coming out with the non-core assets. No, uh, that, that'll evolve over the next couple of years, and and we'll determine sort of. We may bring facilities at one time. We may bring outdoor recreation at, at one time. So we'll see where we're at in the process and and when the appropriate timing is to bring those reports to council. Um, yeah, I don't think we've established firm dates at this point in time. Okay, so we won't be moving on this for a couple of years, but in that couple of years, given the current path that we're on, I mean, we're down to what, 93% in the fair to good? Is that gonna really hurt us or is this something we should be looking at immediately? No, I, I, you know, I think we will, I think we're comfortable with the time frame that we have to work within over the next couple of years. You can see that on the slide, I think it was just, a degradation of about 2% over a five year period. Um, I think it was around 94 and almost 95%. And now it's about around 92 and a half um, overall with respect to the, to the core assets. Um, I don't, you know, if there's anything from an emergency or an immediacy standpoint, obviously that would be brought forward to council at, at that time. But I think the time frame that we're working towards, we're, we're comfortable with. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. To, uh, Director Valentin, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, just as a note, that like we are using the asset management plan to help us build our capital budgets uh, on a, on a go-forward basis. So that is one of the um, tools that we use when we determine what comes forward in the capital budget each year. Just wanted to reiterate that to Council. Thank you. The next speaker is Regional Councillor Dyes, followed by Councillor Tyler Moran. Go ahead, Duran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess my concern too is if we're going to factor in uh, some of the experiences we're having with extreme heat and cold through the seasons, which can also exacerbate some of our assets, make it, I guess, uh, I guess make it quicker or, or, or that asset management program that should last, you know, 20 years, 40 years, it quickens up to a shorter time period given these uh, severe weather events. So are those gonna be taken into account? So um, through the chair to regional councillor dies, climate change is a component of the asset management plan. So your question is, 
something that we have talked about because you may have assets that are 30 40 50 years old that are required for replacement but it doesn't necessarily mean that the like for like replacement is needed there may be upgrades or expansions required as a result of climate change whether that's a pipe size or or what have you so climate change is definitely front and center in terms of our um, decision making as we move forward we have our risk and resiliency plan that council had previously approved that especially from a heat and whether it's ice, snow, rain um, events in terms of some of the, the projections that are being used so that when we are looking to replace assets as part of the asset management plan, climate change is, is part of the decision-making criteria. Um, Rick, do you have anything to, to add to that? No, that's, that's pretty much sums it up. Um, so as, as projects are, or assets are replaced, they would be, you'd look at that under a um, climate change lens and uh, make changes that you, you need to make for the future. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I'm glad to hear that you're looking at that. Um, and just wanted clarification when uh, Councillor Lee spoke to natural hair, the natural heritage and natural assets, because they are assets and they do protect our hard infrastructure assets. Um, for example, you know, trees can prevent strong winds and, and create a barrier. And of course, they also absorb run up as do our parks and green spaces. So I'm wondering why we don't put a value on these natural assets, because if we do have an intense storm that takes out a lot of our structures, we have to replace those natural assets as well. And we've seen over time how trying to replace natural assets along a creek doesn't necessarily work. And the cost of those man-made infrastructures are huge. So, you know, I really would like to um, see uh, us take seriously these natural assets and put a value on them and look at how they work in tandem with the ones that we put in place, the man-made assets. So is this something we can consider? We, um, when we again, when we look at our, and I'll use our, our trees as an example, we do have a value of our, our trees. So we have, you know, we've got them identified by size, species, location, and it's very detailed and, and we have established values associated with those natural assets. Rick, you can speak to other na natural assets in terms of how we're going about and sort of what would be presented through the asset management plan. Um, other assets, natural assets would be, um, we could include ditches and um, marsh areas, things like that, but land itself, like the waterfront land is not an, an asset that falls under the asset management plans. So I th I what think happens when you lose three parts of the trail? The trail is. <laughs> <laughs> but the bluff is not. So these are, these are some of the issues that um, I think we need to look at because, you know, the bluff is going to continue to recede and it's getting in the pinch points closer and closer to some of the houses along Lake Driveway. It's just a matter of time. I don't know how many, many years ahead, but I think it, it really is you know, important to also uh, incorporate the natural assets where possible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Ballantin, you did have your hand up a minute ago. Did you wanna comment on something? Um, thank you, Councillor Bauer. Um, just with regards to um, a, a comment that Councillor Dyes had made with regards to like emergencies and climate change, um, that's part of the reason that when we review our capital budget and look at asset management plan, these are things that we um, do keep in mind. <clears throat> um, you know, as we move forward through this asset management plan under the regulations, we will have to have a financial, a long-term financial plan in place. Um, that's great if everything is replaced, you know, every 20 years or what have you, like when the schedule is, but, um, you know, through climate change and through some of these disasters, 
that kind of prompts the um, replacement and rehabilitation of other assets that perhaps were not identified, were identified further out. So that becomes where uh, one of the challenges from financing, uh, from a financial perspective, how we look at these. And this is why we, you know, we rely on the asset management plan and we will be relying on the levels of service of what expectations are and how we look to fund that. And uh, so I just wanted to bring that point up as well. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Tyler Moran, followed by Councillor Kahn. Go ahead, Rob. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, staff, for this report, Dave and your team, uh, Rick. You mentioned the bridge by Mill Street. Is that the bridge under the 401? Yes, it's it's just slightly to the to the north of the 401, but almost under it, yes. Right, and is that bridge part of Canada Trail? I believe, right? It's it's a walking bridge, or are you talking about the road as Church Street? We're talking about the road, the roadway bridge. Okay, because the trail bridge, I think, would be part of a grant that we had been trying to bring to fruition with the federal government. Okay, so that's two different things. So we're talking about the bridge on Church Street. Yes. Thank you for the clarity. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, Councillor Khan, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we we're talking about natural assets, and I don't know if this is relevant to this conversation we're having right now, but um, has the trail at Duffins Trail North, Ajax, parallel adjacent to the Pickoff properties that's been underwater for the past couple of years, has this been taken into any consideration through this? The trails, trails being a, um, a non-core asset, um, will be part of the next plan that we we bring out. Um, so we, we we will be looking at, um, of course, of uh, the trail and the trail conditions. When is this next plan coming out? Sorry, if I could just if I could just jump in. Sorry, um, regional council or sorry, Councillor Khan, are you referring to the Carruthers Carruthers trail? Carlos? The one think, on the water, yeah, yes. that's the car. Oh, right? Yeah, no, there's. I just wanted to clarify because you'd mentioned dolphins, but I'm pretty sure that it was Crothers that you were okay, that, the one underwater, you're, right? That you're referencing, and that is part of a bigger project that's currently underway that Cameron Richardson in planning and development that is, is currently working on. Um, he's working on that with um, in partnership with TRCA. And part of the solution is looking at realigning that portion of the trail, right? So we are aware that there's, it's gonna be a constant problem the way that it's been positioned and there are plans to deal with it through that specific project. Um, I know Mr. Romanowski is here. I'm not sure, Jeff, if you have any current information or update with respect to that project. Sorry, Dave, can you repeat that? Yeah, it was just with respect to that Crothers trail sort of adjacent to the Peacock property, what the project that Cameron was sort of working on with TRCA and that whole restoration project. Yeah, I believe that was with TRCA, Ducks Unlimited and a bunch of other groups. Uh, that project is underway. I know they were out there doing some assessments in the fall. Uh, I haven't got a recent update from Mr. Richardson, but I can definitely follow up with council on that and, and let them know further as to the details of that. Yeah, I guess it's been underwater, as we all know, for quite some time. And then with the winter and spring coming, it's not going to get any better, right? So we'd really love an update on that, um, directors. For sure. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Thank you for the report. I just have a couple of questions. Um, so, Mr. Chalmers, during the presentation, you mentioned that some of the stormwater ponds, uh, you we weren't sure if they had been dredged by the developers prior to the town assuming them. So, is that something that could be made a requirement going forward to dredge before we assume, like on the developer or even? you know, at X number of years, could we mandate that that the developer dredge those? Yeah, I, I think through planning, I think Mr. Romanowski might be able to answer that one the best. Um, okay. I think they're requiring prior to assumption that they're cleaned out. Thank you. 
Mr. Reddy, I see you. Did you want to answer that? Yeah, uh, it's absolutely uh, through the chair. There's absolutely a, a requirement for developers to clean the ponds uh, prior to assumption. It and is. it has been for it has been for quite some time. Perhaps some of the the very very older ponds, like like in the '90s, that might not have been a requirement. But any anything recent, we ask for up to date topographical surveys, which show the the pond. Um, the, the bottom of the pond elevations, and then we compare those to the design drawings, which we would have approved through the subdivision uh, approvals, and we compare them and make sure that they're where they're supposed to be. Excellent. Okay, thank you. And if I may, through the chair, just quick follow up to Councillor Khan's question with regards to um, the project there over in the Carruthers. Uh, Mr. Richardson just said that we're awaiting formal funding uh, approval through the feds and it's being funded through the COVID recovery uh, lens. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Romanowski. And then I guess my other question is, it might be rhetorical, but um, so the province legislated these asset management plans and forecasting um, of all of our core assets. Um, likely knowing that municipalities would end up with funding gaps? I, I don't know, I'm just guessing that. And I'm really glad to hear that Ajax is relatively well positioned compared to the other municipalities. And then CAO Baker says sort of what, what a, one of our responses will be to lobby other levels of government for more funding. So, so what, what did they, what did the problem, like what did they think was going to happen here? That we were going to get a, a base level of our conditions and then our levels of services, et cetera. And then everybody says, okay, we've got funding gaps. We got to go ask the province who legislated this for more money. Like, I don't understand that. Is that, a, is it rhetorical yeah. <laughs> or who wants to try? Me, me. Oh. Hey, go ahead, Diane. Thanks, uh, Councillor Bauer. Um, so I think the province, um, and through this regulation, they were hearing from municipalities saying, we need money, we need money. So I think they're just looking for proof at this point um, to, to just see where, where are our issues lying and which municipalities. And as was stated through the presentation, Ajax is fairly um, new or has new newer infrastructure. Um, so although we, you know, we are in fairly good condition right now, that can change quite quickly. But that's why the province requires asset management plans to be updated on a regular basis. So that we're going through, we're identifying, and we have comparatives as we move forward to see what has happened. Um, as I mentioned, federal gas tax is one of the, it's, it's a permanent funding source now from the federal government. Um, the town of Ajax uses the majority of its federal gas tax funding for our roads, for our core infrastructure, and that's helping us um, keep that level um, in, in fairly good uh, condition. Thank you. That makes sense that they need proof that we need the money. I saw um, Mr. Chalmers put his hand up and then maybe CAO Baker wanted to comment. Go ahead, please. Um, a long time back before this um, regulation came out, I, I think that there was municipalities that were applying for, for grants to build, um, uh, for instance, a new community center. But at the same time, they had assets that were failing and they weren't spending the money on those assets. They were building new things. So I think that's why the province has um, wants to know the condition and make sure they're spending their money in the right places. Thank you for that. Uh, CAO Baker, did you have anything to add? No, I actually, I think that Diane and Rick answered your rhetorical question quite well. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions before we, um, is there a report or a recommendation we need to pass here? Or we'll just move to the next presentation. Let me see. Okay. So Noah, are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. So uh, let's move to 4.2, the Asset Management Council workshop. And again, I will call on Director Meredith, please. You're muted. <clears throat> 
Yep. Nope. Um, don't need to add anything further to it. I'll just turn it over and, and have the presentation. It's fine. Thanks. Okay. So I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, so moving on to the second part of the agenda today, I've, I've asked Amin Singh from SLBC Advisory Services to join us today to conduct an asset management workshop. SLBC is one of the consultants working on the town's asset level of service uh, strategic plan that's currently underway. Amin has extensive experience serving municipalities, utilities, and asset intensive organizations on asset management, governance, risk management, as well as operational and functional transformations. The intent of this workshop is to provide an overview of asset management, provide some clarity on the responsibilities of the town under the asset management regulation, and offer key elements of a financial strategy. I'll let Amin take it from here. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, I just wanted to check that everybody could see the, the presentation. Yes, we can, thank you. Very good, thank you. Okay, thank you, Rick, and good morning. My name is Amin Singh with SLBC, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning speaking to all of you about asset management. Um, I also want to say in preparation for this workshop, I was pleasantly surprised to see the aspirations of the town's asset management vision and principles and a lot of the good work that staff are doing through formalized processes and practices, which are endorsed by its leaders, do embody the key elements of a good asset management program. For our agenda today, we'll start with an overview of asset management and the benefits of an asset management program. Following this, we'll walk through some fundamental asset management concepts using the town's current asset management plan as an example. As part of this portion of the presentation, we'll be focusing on the state of local infrastructure, levels of service, risk management, life cycle management, and funding. Um, we have allocated some time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers, um, but I would encourage anybody to stop the presentation at any point if you do have a question or if you'd like some further clarification. So we'll start with the benefits and requirements of an asset management program. So in general, um, I think as many of you will come across asset management training and literature, uh, you'll find that there's a lot of jargon in asset management and views on what it is and what it isn't. Many organizations uh, tend to think asset management is strictly focused on maintenance management, um, while others hold the view that it's about having in place an asset management technology solution or systems. But ultimately, what we're trying to achieve from an asset management program is the lowest cost of asset ownership in an environment of limited resources while delivering services your customers and regulators require at acceptable levels of risk. And this can be achieved by striking the right balance between the services you provide together with the cost of service and understanding of risk. A good asset management program can also help uh, organizations like municipalities address other key challenges they face. For example, um, good asset management business processes and data management help with knowledge loss from staff that retire or move to a new position or to a new organization. A levels of service program, similar to the one that the um, town is currently undertaking, helps with managing customer demands, regulatory compliance, as well as understanding the financial needs to provide service over the long run, which is a key theme of the new regulation OREC 58817. And risk management helps identify and address security, emergency, climate change, and how to prioritize your resources to manage both aging and growth uh, of your communities and your asset bases. So um, Rick did go through the general requirements. Uh, Mr. Chalmers did go through the general requirements of OREC 58817. I'll just provide a, a sort of different lens on sort of what it's intending to do. Um, the intent of the regulation, or 58817, is ultimately to ensure that municipalities can demonstrate financial sustainability over a 10-year planning horizon. 
And <clears throat> financial sustainability means our taxes or revenues cover all of our life cycle costs, including operations, maintenance, renewal, upgrade, and growth. The state of good repair program is fully funded, which means we don't get into situations where we have large backlogs of renewal works. Financial responsibility is shared between current and future residents. And I'll talk a little bit uh, later in the presentation about this idea of intergenerational equity. And uh, we can manage our growth within reasonable levels of taxes, rates, and debt ratios. Industry and best practices endorse the following requirements for the development of a robust asset management program. This includes first having in place an asset management strategy to guide the improvement of asset management capability within an organization. So this would be things like having in place good risk management processes and practices, data, technology, levels of service, uh, maintenance, renewal, and capital plans, project management delivery capability, monitoring, condition and performance assessments, um, as well as the right tools and sort of data requirements to support all of that. The second would be governance to execute the asset management strategy and key activities. In most municipalities, asset management tends to be somebody's second job. So the idea behind having dedicated roles here is that you can actually execute good capability. And it's been shown that that investment does have a quick return um, and pays for itself. Um, the third would be business processes and practices to standardize how asset management activities are undertaken so that budgeting and risk management are done in a consistent and standard way across the organization. The fourth would be technology enablers to automate processes. And the fifth would be data to support evidence-based decision-making. So, you know, many people ask, what are some of the benefits of a good asset management program? Generally speaking, in the absence of a formal program, uh, life is generally good until you have a surprise asset failure or service interruptions. And generally when these surprises happen, they're costly to an organization. And when they do happen, the organization's only recourse at that point is to find some money and address the surprise. And then life is good again until the next surprise happens. So a good asset management program helps organizations be proactive, in control, and minimizes failures and interruptions to service. A good asset management program also supports um, improved service delivery and financial performance uh, because it will help you optimize resource allocation and the timing for maintenance, operations, renewal, and capital projects. Generally speaking, if you're spending money too early or too late, you're spending too much. The second is industry benchmarking has also shown time and time again, there are material cost savings when you understand what projects you need to do and when in which projects do not need to be done, in other which projects can be deferred. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. Another benefit is compliance with OREC 58817, um, which has the added benefit of making you eligible for grant funding as um, the director had pointed out for finance. Um, the intent of the regulation and what it is prescribing for all intents and purposes is to one, have municipalities understand and formalize what services they are providing today and what services they intend to provide over the next 10 years. Two, to understand the cost of those services over the next 10 years. Three, to understand and have in place a plan for managing the risks related to having an infrastructure gap. In other words, a situation where the funding needs are higher than the allocated budgets. And four, for municipalities to assign point responsibility for the first three points I just made to one executive that will be responsible for asset management when it comes to fid the fiduciary duty related to sustainable service delivery. And it also highlights council's role uh, in this as well. So I know earlier there was a question around, you know, what did the province expect to find? I think generally, in addition for proof, 
is just to get municipalities to have in place the processes and practices to understand uh, how much money they needed over the next 10 years. Um, and then also to drive uh, an integration between the financial aspects of planning with delivery so that they're not two independent activities. Um, what this ultimately does is may have you look at and rebalance sort of your long-term financial plan so that it meets um, not only the next 10 years, but also looks at sort of who's using the assets and who's paying for it in terms of the current generation of users and the next generations of users. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's reassuring to see that the aspirations of the town's asset management mission and asset management principles do embody uh, the key elements of a good asset management program that we've just discussed. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on a few projects with the town in the asset management space, and I would say that there are some great fundamental foundational items in place that will help you be very successful to meet some of the um, challenges that you might have in sort of closing infrastructure gaps and meeting the, the regulatory requirements of um, OREG 58817. Okay, so over the next few slides, we'll look at some key elements of a sound asset management plan. And essentially what I'm going to do is try to leverage the town's asset management plan that was just completed by Mr. Chalmers, um, just to provide some examples that are relevant uh, to the town. So we'll start with the uh, state of local infrastructure, and this essentially focuses on understanding the condition profiles of the town's assets, as well as replacement costs. Um, next, we'll move on to levels of service, where we document the services and service measures we are providing to our residents. Uh, we'll then look at risk management, which is endeavors to identify critical assets and informs prioritization of operations and maintenance renewal and capital resources. Following this, we'll look at life cycle management, which um, essentially the purpose of life cycle management is to understand what the cost or the need is to provide the various uh, services we do provide through our asset classes over the, a 10 year planning horizon and beyond. And it will also identify if there is an infrastructure gap. And an infrastructure gap is essentially just the difference between the money that's needed and the money that's available. And then uh, we'll close with the financial strategy, which focuses um, on the amount of money that we have and how much money we need and the difference between the two. So we'll jump into the uh, state of local infrastructure. And again, we'll use some examples from the report that Mr. Chalmers uh, just presented prior. So <clears throat> this slide shows the town's condition profile uh, categorized from very good to very poor along with the replacement value for its stormwater and transportation portfolios. Uh, again, as Mr. Chalmers had pointed out, the town's stormwater and transportation portfolios do have a favorable condition profile with 86% of the stormwater assets and 95% of the transportation assets being in fair or better condition. A key point is to note that the goal is not to have all your assets in the very good condition category because it's not practical from the cost perspective but rather to focus on allocating your resources on the right assets at the right time so that your most critical assets to service delivery remain in a state of good repair. And the assets that are sliding into the poor and very poor categories are non-critical and have little impact on service delivery if they do fail. And this is a very rational and fiscally prudent approach to supporting the long-term financial sustainability of any municipality. So, if you look at the infrastructure gap that exists now, um, while the town is going to take some steps and activities to uh, you know, close that infrastructure gap, we recognize that that's not going to happen tomorrow morning. And it might be a five or 10 or 15 year journey. So the idea is that in the meantime, the staff uh, can use the available funding and ensure that they're going to the right assets uh, to minimize risk of, of asset failures, uh, as well as consequences to the town and service interruption. So there is also this um, document called the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card, or CIRC for short. 
And CERC essentially provides national benchmark information related to asset condition profiles for most municipal assets um, across Canada. And in this table, the first two columns um, show the national condition profiles for transportation and stormwater assets uh, in fair or better condition and poor and very poor condition, respectively. In the third column, we see the town's condition profile for its transportation and stormwater assets is better than the national averages. So in the third column, you'll see that the town has about 14% more of its transportation assets in fair or better condition compared to national averages and about 2% more of its stormwater assets in fair or better condition compared to national averages. <clears throat> so one of the reasons these condition profiles look good is because long lived assets like roads or even buildings, which might last anywhere from 50 to 80 years, tend to exhibit a very slow deterioration initially, and then a very rapid one as they get to closer to end of life. And um, as Mr. Um, Dave Meredith pointed out, uh, the town's assets are relatively young. So the town has an opportunity now to be proactive and get ahead of its peers that are experiencing massive backlogs of operations and maintenance and renewal and condition profiles with a lot more assets sitting in the very poor and poor categories uh, to address this over the next, let's say, five to 15 years. So in the next set of slides, um, we'll step through the service delivery model to meet the asset management regulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, Mr. Chalmers did provide an overview of this, and I might just provide it from a different lens, uh, demonstrating how it also helps you uh, manage performance um, of the resources you're spending versus just documenting the services and sort of the performance against those. So an ideal service delivery model um, should provide a line of sight from the town's corporate objectives and priorities to its budgeting process. So in other words, any money being spent at the town through any budget should be able to be linked to the corporate priorities or, or to meet legal and le legislative requirements. Um, so this way we're able to trace the town's commitments to service delivery through to its budgets or the resources that it's spending. So this service del delivery model is currently being developed at the town and it does just that. So the model starts with the town's service objectives related to its three strategic pillars of connecting the community investing in the community and leading in the community along with the legal and regulatory obligations that it has. Following this, um, the model looks to translate the town's service delivery commitments uh, into customer levels of services. And customer levels of services just means how do residents of the town receive or experience the service um, that they're getting through the town. And essentially what the model is doing is saying that we can throw all of these levels of services into three buckets. The first is capacity and use, which is about having enough of the service and making sure that they're accessible. The second is function, and this looks at all services that focus on um, protecting or limiting health, safety, security, natural and heritage impacts. And the third bucket is quality which consists of um, service measures related to service reliability and responsiveness to customers. Once the customer levels or services are in place, we further impact these into technical levels of services. And the technical level of service is just how do we measure the community level of service? So Mr. Chalmers and um, Mr. Meredith had provided an example of the pavement quality index uh, that they use internally at the town in order to manage a community level of service related to the road network. Following this, the model then looks to evaluate the risk to service delivery. Here, essentially, what the model is trying to understand is where the organization is not meeting its growth, upgrade, renewal, and O&M uh, or operations and maintenance service delivery targets. And this typically happens when the budgets are lower than the needs. Um, and this is where you would also account for any risks to the organization, uh, including climate change risks. The outcome of the risk assessment uh, is essentially a rebalancing of how and when we apply our resources 
so that we're focused on funding assets that have the highest impact to service delivery if they do fail. Um, or you can think about it as prioritizing funding to the most critical assets. Next, we established the life cycle activities uh, or asset interventions needed to meet our service targets. And when we have our life cycle management activities, we can now cost them because we know what life cycle activities are being done and the frequency uh, of the intervention. And finally, when the budgets are assigned across the organization, uh, if they are lower than the need, which is often the case, uh, the result is that some life cycle activities or asset interventions need to be deferred. Um, so there's a need to reevaluate the remaining or residual risk that materializes from not having enough money. And so one of the requirements of the regulation is essentially where you do have an infrastructure gap, so we don't have as much budget as we've requested, uh, is to understand what risk is being posed to service delivery and then how the town is going to go about sort of managing that risk. So the regulation doesn't require you to actually close the infrastructure gap. They want you to identify it. They want you to understand the risks of having an infrastructure gap. And then they want you to sort of have a plan in place for managing it. So as I mentioned, one way to manage the infrastructure gap is essentially to ensure that um, funding flows to the most critical assets that have the ability to materialize liabilities um, where people could get hurt. There's major service delivery interruptions uh, or infrastructure um, costs to get the infrastructure back in place um, are, are quite material. So let's just look at an illustrative example of what the model looks like in practice. So under the um, community level of service, uh, we have a, under the quality category, um, a customer level of service that commits the organization will provide a transportation network that is predictable and continuous. Under the technical level of service um, boxes, you'll see that uh, in this case, we've said in order to do that, we're going to maintain an average pavement quality index of 70 or greater. And in the box to the right that's highlighted, uh, we'll say that in order to achieve a pavement quality index of 70, we need to do the following activities. Inspect the pavement every three years, do crack ceiling at year eight, uh, do a mill and pave when the pavement quality index hits 60 or at, or at age 15, uh, do a second mill and pave rehab when the pavement quality index hits 60 or approximately at year 30, and then finally undertake full reconstruction uh, of the pavement road segment when the PQI hits 40 or at around year 45. Um, since we know what these activities are and when they're going to be done, we can actually obviously cost these life cycle management activities and then that sort of develops our need. So <clears throat> this example sort of illustrates two things. The first is how we can link service delivery objectives uh, to our budgeting process while considering risk. And um, the second thing it does is generally in most asset classes, industry has matured to the point that it will tell you what interventions you need to do over the life of the asset in order to get the lowest life cycle cost ownership of the asset. So in the example of the roads, <clears throat> if you did the interventions of inspection, crack ceiling, the two million paves and the full reconstruction at those time frames, or plus or minus sort of adjusted for your own environment. Uh, generally, you're going to be spending the lowest amount of money to keep that road at a pavement quality index of 70. Okay, so we just talked about residual risk, and uh, that's going to be our next topic. <clears throat> So a formalized service delivery model, uh, like the one we just looked at, um, is a prerequisite to undertaking risk management. So in asset management, we need to know our service delivery measures and targets to assess risk. And once you have in place uh, even a very basic um, capability of risk, it's a very powerful tool that can help you um, inform uh, a variety of asset management planning activities. So as Mr. Chalmers uh, mentioned, <clears throat> risk is just the likelihood that an event is gonna occur and then the consequence that the organization will 
uh, be subject to if the risk does materialize. So when you do a risk assessment of a portfolio of assets, let's say roads, um, you'll end up with a risk profile for the asset portfolio, which includes a risk point for each asset. So in this example, each dot may represent a segment of roadway. Uh, it could be a stormwater pond, uh, or it could be a component of a building. Once we have our risk profile established, uh, we can now use this to help us make better business decisions. So let's look at an example where we have an asset, let's say it's a segment of road uh, sitting above a risk threshold line in the high risk zone, which means we have to do something about it. So there's two critical pieces of information we get from this exercise that help us uh, make better decisions. The first is an understanding of the cost of the risk if it happens. So someone in the organization says, we have a segment of road, it's been flagged as a high risk for failure. And so if we do nothing and the risk does materialize, so the, the road fails in some way, um, you'll be able to monetize the financial li liability to the organization um, and the, the risk that you'll be subject to if the risk does materialize. So the first thing we have is what happens if we do nothing? What is the cost of the organization if the risk materializes? The second is the cost and risk reduction of different options or interventions we can take to reduce the risk of that asset. So this actually helps build a very powerful business case sort of for intervention because we can demonstrate that we have a risk and if we do not address it, the organization could face a risk cost of $10. But we have looked at different options and for $3, we can mitigate that $10 risk to the organization. Um, also, if you've conducted a risk assessment, you've assessed probability and consequence. And consequence is a proxy for asset criticality. So in other words, assets with high consequence of failure are considered highly critical, and assets with low consequences of failure are considered low criticality. And we can use asset criticality to help us identify the types of preventive maintenances we do on our assets. So the idea really is that for more critical assets, uh, this is where we want to be more predictive and proactive and intervene ahead of asset failures. Um, and for the moderately critical assets, these would be good candidates for time-based maintenance and low critical assets would be good candidates for run to failure strategies. And so if you looked at the condition profile we looked at earlier in the presentation, generally what you want to do is for your high critical assets, ensure that they stay in the good and very good sort of categories. And the moderate critical assets can go into fair and assets that you should allow to slide into the poor and very poor categories would be assets that are low criticality. Generally speaking, from a cost savings perspective, um, the organization will also achieve the lowest cost of its maintenance program if it's able to achieve a balance of somewhere between 75 and 80% proactive and 20 to 25% reactive as part of its maintenance programs. And generally you'll know when you're there because the assets that are failing are the ones that you want to fail and you have fewer failures of critical assets that you didn't expect to fail. Risk can also help inform decisions uh, related to renewal and capital programming. The idea here is simple. Um, high risk assets should be prioritized for renewal capital dollars first. Moderate risk assets should be in the middle of your capital renewal and, and maintenance sort of um, priorities. And low risk assets should be at the tail end of your 10 year plans. Uh, these are also good candidates, again, I, as I mentioned for deferrals. So if a asset owner had 100 projects they needed to do, and the funding suggested they can only do 80 of those. Naturally, what they want to do is take the 20 lowest critical assets and defer those, um, because what they're essentially saying is if they do fail, we don't have uh, we have a, a relatively lower risk to the organization from a health and safety perspective, environmental perspective, cost perspective, safety, reputation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
So um, <clears throat> this slide shows the value of transportation assets sitting in different risk zones. Um, and here we can see the town has a good balance of risks from low to high. So again, the idea isn't that you want to manage all of your risks down to low risk. You um, want to have some assets uh, that are ready for intervention and other assets that you're going to intervene in later and some assets that you might not get to because they're low criticality. Um, and here's the same for your stormwater assets. And again, uh, the town has uh, a good profile uh, of risk for both these major asset classes. Uh, and again, a window of opportunity to manage its risk because essentially over time, as assets age and are utilized, they naturally gravitate to the top right of these graphs or to the high risk zones if they're not taken care of. So next we'll look at life cycle management and funding analysis. <clears throat> so this graph shows the forecast need for stormwater assets over the next 100 years in blue. The red line shows the average need per year and the green line shows the current funding. And here we can see there's an infrastructure gap of about $3.3 million per year. So um, I think some of these figures were um, presented by uh, Mr. Chi and Mr. Chalmers. So I just want to bring maybe some two additional notes to think about here. Um, the first is from an intergenerational equity perspective, we see that if we underfund assets now, future residents and generations will have to pay a much higher tax burden to fund these assets that are being consumed by current residents. The second is, um, as the infrastructure backlog grows, that is you have this accumulation of the $3.3 million shortfall per year, this will translate into condition profiles uh, that are not that do not look favorable. So you'll have a lot more assets that slide from the very good and good and fair into the poor and very poor categories. <clears throat> This is the same graph for the transportation assets. Um, as Mr. Chalmers had mentioned, we see that there's um, a much larger infrastructure gap here. And uh, again, by 2051, um, over the next uh, 30 years, the count, town's condition profile for its transportation assets will shift significantly if the infrastructure gap is not addressed. Um, just in the last session, I know there was a comment that you know the the infrastructure gap sort of the condition profile had slid from 94% to 92% over a five year period. But keep in mind that there's going to come a point where you have a large portfolio of your roads that were, let's say, built 30 years ago, that are going to come to failure all at once. And the rate of deterioration is going to accelerate con considerably as that asset gets closer to its end of life. So um, again, in terms of the funding gap, which is the difference between the current revenues um, and, and uh, needed revenues, uh, again, we see that there's about $13.87 million funding gap for capital and about a $1.46 million gap for operating costs. Um, my experience having done a number of asset management plans and worked with uh, many municipalities, I'd say that you're, again, as um, uh, this Mr. CAO had uh, mentioned, uh, you're in a fairly good spot right now in terms of your gap um, and sort of what it represents in terms of the percentage of your portfolio asset value. So I had mentioned that the uh, Canadian Infrastructure Report Card provides some national benchmarking figures. Um, so in addition to providing it for condition profiles, it also provides it for the average annual reinvestment rates. So here we can see the first column shows the average annual reinvestment rate from the town's asset management plan, which is prepared by Mr. Chalmers. And um, the second column shows the lower and upper target reinvestment rates recommended by the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card. So there's a couple of um, sort of takeaways from this. The first is that we can see that the town's recommended reinvestment rates are generally aligned to the national averages. Um, the, th the third column, uh, where we can see the town's current actual reinvestment rate uh, suggests that the town is investing significantly lower than the recommended town and Canadian infrastructure national benchmarking rates for both its storm and transportation assets. So 
at the current reinvestment rates, uh, and if the reinvestment is continually deferred, uh, again, you know, the town's transportation and stormwater condition profiles will move uh, from a profile with a lot more assets in the green, so good and very good, to a profile that's sort of more reflective of what we can see on the right-hand side of this graph, where you've kind of got a flip, but most of your assets are sitting in the orange and red, so poor and very poor, and then fewer so in the categories of fair, good, and very good. <clears throat> so the last few slides suggest that there is an opportunity uh, to move uh, away from the pay-as-you-go philosophy, um, which is sort of becoming uh, more of a discussion at many municipalities, uh, and introduce concepts of equity of current and future users of services by leveraging the um, available levers you have through your financial uh, strategy or, or capability, which is namely sort of looking at how we can align our, our revenue policies, capital management, reserve and debt management, uh, so that we can ensure that uh, users of the services are paying for those services and they're not being deferred uh, to future users. <clears throat> so there's only a, a few more slides and generally in these slides, um, we're gonna just kind of do a very high level touch on the financial strategy, uh, more so focusing on some recommendations based on where the town is today. Um, and we'll look at the four areas again of revenue, capital management, reserve and debt management. So general recommendations for capital management for the town, um, again, just reiterating from the previous presentation would be to use the service delivery model uh, to drive the life cycle needs and then integrate that needs into the budgeting process so that the infrastructure gap is considered um, together with the financing plan. Um, and also look at considering increasing infrastructure reinvestment rates in line with the Canadian infrastructure recommendations, as well as the town uh, asset management plan recommendations. The recommendations for reserve management include continuing to build reserves uh, through enhanced taxes and rates. Uh, so I know in the previous presentation, there was some talk about a potential stormwater rate. Um, recommendations for debt management are to leverage debt and town policies to support infrastructure reinvestments. Uh, I know in preparation for this presentation, uh, we did discuss that the town had recently expanded some of its debt uh, policies to include uh, additional assets as well. So that's very uh, reassuring to hear. And finally, recommendations for revenue management. Essentially, these recommendations sits around enhancing revenue with consideration of intergenerational equity and the infrastructure backlog and infrastructure gap. Um, so generally speaking, there's a lot of, um, uh, I, I would say, sentiment around, you know, who pays for this? Is it the province? Is it the federal government? Or is it the municipality? Um, there's some sentiment that there's only one taxpayer. So essentially that infrastructure gap has to be closed by that taxpayer. But uh, there is an opportunity uh, that many municipalities are looking at to see if they can um, take advantage of the current environment and participate in lower debts, the active investment opportunities that municipalities are able to participate in now and sort of reevaluate sort of tax and revenue uh, in rate um, capabilities or opportunities uh, to manage the infrastructure gap so that at the very least it's stable and under control and you can manage the risk of that gap and it's fair for uh, the residents of Ajax today and residents of our next generation. Okay, so with that, uh, that's the end of the presentation and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I will note that I might need to defer some questions to town staff if it's very specific around, you know, how much roads, how many road kilometers do we have, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Mr. Singh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, are there any questions from members of council at this time? No? Okay. Um, I do have a couple. Um, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, sort of knowing, knowing when to allocate to high criticality assets or low criticality assets. 
what would be an example of a low? Like I'm guessing a high would be our road systems. Um, what's a low criticality asset? Sure. So you can go into any asset class and then you look at criticality relative to that asset class. So you can go into the roads and you might say that we classify highly critical assets as um, roads with higher speeds and higher traffic volumes. Within that same portfolio, we might say that rural roads that are unpaved are mm -hmm. less critical because the likelihood of something happening on those roads, uh, if we don't intervene, people getting hurt is less likely than on those arterial or major collectors. Okay, thank you. That, that answers my question. Thank you. And the other question I had was on the slide about the target and current reinvestment rates, where we have the recommended town rates, uh, the, the Canadian infrastructure targeted rate, and then our current investment rate. So is this all, is this new as a result of our corporate uh, asset management plan? Or is this something like, I, why are our current rates so far off from our recommended and targeted. Is that, would you know the answer to that or is that somebody else? I think I might defer that to town staff if they wanna take a Miss Valentine. Thanks, uh, through to Councillor Bauer. Um, so basically this comes down to our budget and what is being allocated to um, the capital reserves right now. Um, you know, we've been fortunate that um, we've had uh, external revenue sources, um, as you'll see in the next week or so, um, with my capital budget report coming forward. There, there are concerns about our loss of that one particular external revenue source, the casino revenues. <clears throat> um, we are fortunate that we get federal gas tax funding, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, is directed to majority uh, of that funding is directed to uh, roads. Our road infrastructure. Um, but this is something, uh, and this is why we do an asset management plan, and this is why we bring this to council and to public, to make them aware, um, you know, what our challenges are, um, yeah. you know. So I think this is a, a good forum to bring this forward to so that council is aware of, of the challenges. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Director. Are there any other questions or comments for Mr. Singh? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much for your time and presentation today. Very good, thank you. Okay, so that concludes the two presentations. So we'll move to section five, departmental reports. We have 5.1, corporate asset management plan core assets. There are three recommendations here. First, do we have any questions or comments on the report from anyone? Seeing none. Uh, do we have a mover for the recommendations? Recommendation one, the council receive for information, the asset management plan core assets prepared in accordance with the requirements of Ontario Reg 58817. The council endorse in principle, the use of the town's corporate asset management plan for financial planning purposes as it relates to the development of the annual operating budget and the 10 year capital budget. And three, that staff be authorized to take the necessary actions as indicated in this report. Regional Councillor Lee, are you putting your hand up to move it? Okay, thank you. Uh, all in favor? That passes, thank you very much. And that brings us to everyone's favorite part of a meeting, section six, the adjournment. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I see Mayor Collier, all in favor? Thank you everybody. That